This was the third in the series with WWE. We, you know, we saw the Stone Cold Steve Austin one. Uh, we saw the the Roddy Piper one, and we were very positive on those. We didn't, we you know, we acknowledged they didn't really do any hard hitting issues. The Piper one a little bit more because they did talk about his drug use. You know, I guess the extent on the uh, Austin one was talking about his drinking. They could have gone darker on his for sure. Now this Randy Savage one. They didn't hold back, <laughs> you know, like the first hour was kind of pumping you up about his career. Although, as we'll talk about, I took some issue with how they did that, but they Ooh. got some of the big highlights and, you know, they spent a lot of time talking about the steamboat match, of course. And then you get to the second hour and boy, did that thing flip. I saw so many people commenting. It was like two different production teams made this because when they get to the second hour, then they start talking about all the negative stuff, right? Of course, his treatment of Miss Elizabeth over the years, well-known stuff. Every, you know, that's widely known, but, you know, emphasizing again, he wasn't a great husband. He wasn't a great boyfriend. He didn't treat Miss Elizabeth well at all. That's, that's very well-known. Randy Savage is one of my favorite wrestlers of all time. He's on my Mount Rushmore. Love watching that guy. But I know behind the scenes, he wasn't a great guy. And they certainly let the viewers know that. And then they got into the Stephanie Beller stuff, who, uh, Later in life, you know, was his girlfriend in the WCW, the later years of WCW, Gorgeous George. They went into some of her stories. She's gone way beyond that and some other interviews she's given over the years. Yeah. Um, but they, they went into that. And so, guys, you know, I was tweeting about it. We've been talking about it in our Facebook group. I want to get your takes on, on all of this. Uh, Kyle, I know you you were jazzed up to talk about this. You got some notes on this. I mean, give me your take. What did you think? <sighs> okay. Um there were a few issues that I had with it, but first I want to throw something around the horn. I wonder how we would have felt about this documentary had it aired first or second out of the first three. Like I think because, like you said, with the Austin and the Piper ones, they barely went negative at all. It just came across so jarring to see this one, them go after him so hard. And is that why there was kind of the reaction online about it? Just because, hey, we're coming off these two puff pieces and it's like, well, why is Randy Savage getting this treatment? Obviously, people are going to run wild with that. No pun intended, Hulk Hogan. Um, <laughs> but, you know, what you look for, and there's different filmmakers. There's no doubt about that. We're working with different filmmakers, but, you know, we talked about with the Austin one, um, you know, they didn't bring up domestic violence at all. And we were all like, well, you know, would he agree to do it if they did? And in this case, it's a little more convenient to bring it up because the subject matter is deceased. So it'll be interesting moving forward. If Randy Savage is the only one they go negative on like this, that's... I don't know what that says. If yeah. he's the only one they go negative. All you ask for, I think, is consistency um, on these things. I mean, I, I think they should have gone uh, negative on everybody. It's part of the story. You can't just whitewash that stuff. Um, you know, this is pro wrestling. I've said it before. Everybody kind of has skeletons in their closet in this business. There aren't many patron saints. So, you know, I, I, I don't know how I felt about it. I mean, I, I thought the stuff for the most part, with the exception of Hogan Bubba the Love Sponge, was fair game to talk about. Uh, Meltzer said, you know, with Stephanie Bellers, you mentioned she's gone further in other interviews. Um, Stephanie Bellers, a.k.a. Gorgeous George, that, you know, she could have said a lot more, is what Meltzer said on that documentary. He kind of animated, well, you know, I mean, if you thought she was, you know, going after him, <laughs> she was sitting on some stuff. So, you know, um, I'll trust Meltzer in that regard. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that, Justin? Do you think, why do you think the negative blowback came because of the other two? Or do you think it was something different? There, there's definitely that the aspect of compared to the other two, it, it felt like more of a hit job, uh, especially when you take into account some of the other things I think we're going to talk about when it comes to this doc. Um, you know, per what Kyle said, uh, 
when they cover another dead wrestler, it's going to be interesting if they drag all of his skeletons out too. When I'm talking about the ultimate warrior, especially when mm-hmm. I don't, does his wife still work with the company? Yes. 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 Yep. Okay. So, I mean, he's got plenty of really bad shit in his closet too. Uh, maybe not quite to the extent of uh, Randy Savage, but it's there. Um, but even besides from that, I still thought it was a pretty, pretty flawed documentary right from the get go with the uh, introduction of the talking heads with toy figures. Uh, I thought the music, I thought the editing and uh, was all kind of cheesy. It's like, it was all put in there. It's like, okay, I'm, am I not supposed to take this all that seriously? And then you get to the stuff where Lawler's talking about Randy yeah. Savage leaving. And, and that's so bad. Because, I mean, you can look that up to see how wrong that is. I mean, you can say, is he confusing it with Lex Luger? Somebody in that editing bay who put this together has to know that that could have been the case. And you even have Vince jumping in during his talking head saying, like, yep, we were all pretty shocked by that. So just that alone tells me, for one, him making that jump is not all really all that important in the scheme of things. But that tells me well, if I can't trust him on this, what else can I trust them on? Because it doesn't seem to me like they're taking this all that seriously. So why should I? Mm -hmm. That was definitely, I think, the most egregious factual error in the first three docs. Now, we did talk about with the Piper one. uh, Were we talking about a locker room or this? I can't remember. We talk about so much (laughs) wrestling. I don't know where we talk about. I know I said it at one point that, you know, they were treating Piper as if he was a heel his entire career. Yeah. When when he, he th- that wasn't the case through the territories, but um, that was just a case of presentation. I mean, yeah, the story they told about Savage's departure from WWF to WCW was just yeah, it was completely incorrect, and it's not on Lawler. I mean, people have lousy memories. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's on the filmmakers. I mean, you've got to check that. Um, mm-hmm. You know, somebody's got to say, hey, no, that's not accurate. And for the record. The Vince McMahon speech, and I'm sure people have seen this at at this point. Somebody point this out. But the speech Vince McMahon gave on Raw occurred a month before Savage debuted. They completely were aware of what Randy Savage was doing. It was not a surprise. Vince McMahon thought he was done and didn't want him wrestling anymore. Uh, And, you know, he just let him go. Like, I mean, I'm sure he was heard about it. I'm sure he didn't want him to go to Mm -hmm. WCW, but WCW gave him a lot of money and said, okay, and you can wrestle. And Randy's like, okay, I'm out. And the speech that Vince gave on Raw that night by Vince McMahon standards was quite nice. nice. Yeah. 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 I mean, it wasn't like a hard speech. And, you know, that's what's always kind of confused people with the savage WWE relationship since is, you know, Vince didn't seem bitter at all. I mean, obviously the way the money at worst turned out, but you know, he took everybody else back and he didn't take Savage back. Mm-hmm. You know, what is there there? So um, I don't know. So yeah, that was just incorrect. Um, and Lawler saying, Oh yeah. Hey, you know, Vince went up to him. Hey kid, you know, you want to do commentary. That makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah. Um, because uh, you know, uh, as a matter of fact, you know, even confusing it with Luger makes no sense. Because Vince wouldn't have said that to Lawler in regards to Luger because Raw wasn't on that night. Yeah. <laughs> the night mm-hmm. Luger jumped. So, yeah, I, I don't know. Jerry's just like maybe invented some things in his head or is misremembering. But a, a filmmaker's got to catch that. They can't let that air. You know, in, in going back to the, the talking heads, everyone seemed to have a purpose on the previous two with Stone Cold and and Rowdy. Like, it, it, it made sense for all of them to be there. This one was just filled with people. It's like, why are you here? Why are you talking about Randy Savage? You know, you already mentioned Bubba the Love, Love Sponge. Like, I mean, I guess have him on, but not for the entire freaking show. And, and more to the point that this was a hit job. And there's something to me kind of nefarious behind the scenes with the purpose of this is that Lanny and Randy's mom were talking heads, but only at the beginning. And I, I'm wondering if they knew where this thing was going, if they would have wanted any part of it. Mm-hmm. That was one of my biggest issues was the talking heads on this. Yes. Like we were texting about, I mean, all these people, bubble, Lush, love sponge, that comedian guy, I don't even know his name. Uh, he, he was just a fan that does a Randy impersonation. Like why would he be on this? You know, 
he's probably not as qualified to talk about Randy Savage as any of us, to be honest with you. Probably less, <laughs> I would imagine. Uh, and he's on the document. I don't know why he's on the documentary. He made that joke about Randy's death, which I thought awful. Was- poor poor taste that shouldn't have made air either uh they the big thing was they had all of these people on there that they pretended like they were close to him who weren't actually close to him <sighs> right i mean they ha- of course they had his brother on there but like hogan and him we know they didn't get along uh bubba the love sponge he was making fun of randy savage by his own admission on his radio show every morning why is he on here you know so it was like it was like they were trolling you almost because if you followed the guy's career, you know, these people weren't his good friends, you know? So I'm sure there's people who say more positive things about him too, that weren't on there. My, I think you do have to go into the negative. Um, yeah. I, I think that they did a pretty good job telling the Elizabeth story. That's not new. It was on dark side of the ring. I thought they covered that pretty well. In fact, I thought Luger was pretty good on here talking about yeah, his agree. responsibility and, whether or not he was responsible for her death. I thought that that was good. I'm not opposed to Stephanie Beller's telling her story. You know, the relationship was much shorter, but I think she has a place on telling her story. I want to be careful how I approach this, but I have seen, you know, I I mentioned what she's talked about in other interviews. I've heard her give multiple interviews over the years and there's, there's been some credibility issues with some of her stories. Um, she made it seem on here like her and Randy broke up because of the camera incident she talked about, which, hey, it's probably more likely than not that it did happen, mm-hmm. uh, but it may not have happened. I don't know. I don't have any proof of that. It's just it's her word versus someone who's not around anymore. But we know how he treated Elizabeth. Uh, the You know, the the good side of you wants to believe that maybe he learned from that or something, but we don't know. But, you know, I've heard other people say that they broke up because she met that guitarist from the misfits at nitro and she left Randy for him and they ended up getting married and now they've been divorced. I don't know if that plays into how she tells that story or not, but that is, that's out there. So I do think that she should tell the story, but I do think you have to take everything with a grain of salt when you don't have someone to defend themselves. Yeah. You know, I want to go back to something you said at the very beginning, Ryan there uh, about, you know, people, uh, a friendly voice for to give Savage's perspective. I don't know if there was, I mean, Lanny was, I guess, the guy to do it, right? And there wasn't many else because, you know, I was listening to Meltzer talk about this documentary. When Randy got out of the wrestling business, he left it. I mean, he was, I mean, you know, there's the story. I'm sure you guys know it. Like at Brian Adams' funeral, Bret Hart, ran into him and didn't know it was savage yeah because he had the gray beard and you know doing the voice really anymore yeah yeah. well yeah so um i just don't know if there was that person like i don't know who it would have been you know i I don't know who the um to talk about the pillman doc that's airing right now who the you know kim wood in randy for randy savage is i mean i I guess like Nash was pretty, you know, like he was a yeah. fun guy to go out with and stuff. So maybe he said some stuff that didn't. Yeah, make it, uh, I think Brett probably would say some nice things about him. Yeah, but but, but I, I don't. I mean, you, you don't hear these people's like these like great friends of Savage. I mean, he was kind of an a, a aloof guy. With he he did yeah. have you know kind of a crazy personality to him. Um, with Hogan and the real life feud that the two had, you would like to hear some balance there and not just get that from Hogan's perspective. I I think Mm. that was kind of a weakness in the second hour. And, and, you know, as far as what didn't need to make tape, I referenced it earlier, that whole bit with like how him, first of all, Hogan and Bubba the love sponge on the same documentary. (laughs) Seriously. I I mean, (laughs) does Hogan have no shame? I mean, wow. I, you know, I know we're not supposed to make fun of people's looks anymore. It's 2021, but I mean, Bubba the love sponge, you know, I don't know anything about star Wars, but this guy looks like fucking job of the hut squeeze in an NYPD hat. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> okay. I mean, this guy stinks. I, he, he, you know, the comedian Rosenberg and him, that was like, those are the worst. Yeah. Yeah. Like you could have had one of those guys. You didn't need all three. I, I don't think Bubba the love sponge added anything. It was just, it felt like, the producers felt the Tampa radio wars were like yeah. a bigger deal than they were. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you want to mention the, you know, uh, Hogan has to be on the dock. There's no mm-hmm. doubt about it. I mean, Hogan is very much tied 
uh, to Randy Savage in a professional sense. Um, but, you know, I, I just didn't think, you know, Bubba the Love Sponge, yeah, we made fun of him on the radio. I mean, what does that accomplish? Yeah. I mean, that's your claim to fame. You made fun of the guy in the radio and you get a spot. And again, yeah. you look like Jabba the Hutt. I mean, you're wearing an <laughs> NYPD hat. I mean, get out of here, yeah. Bubba the Love Sponge. You know, now that yeah, you'd, you'd mentioned his name just a couple minutes ago, all I really want is someone to re-edit this documentary with just randomly insert Kim Wood calling Vince McMahon a whore. <laughs> over and over and over. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, you know, as far as the Bellers, you, you're right. We you, you talked about this thing she said. I mean, obviously they partied. There's, I mean, Nash was backing up. There's, and there's nothing wrong with partying. For the record, I think taking ecstasy and cutting a promo on Monday Nitro <laughs> is pretty cool. Okay, <laughs> where I come from, that's cool. All right, I, I don't care what 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 you know people say today. That I, that is cool. I would like to take ecstasy and cut a promo on WCW <laughs> Monday Nitro. As a matter of fact, I actually did. Vince Russo let me in the uh, later years. But um, oh, man. you know, I you know, I know Justin and I know Ryan. You two were bothered by the action figure thing. I love action but, figures. Look behind me. But still, like, what the heck, man? Like, what does yeah, this have to do with anything? It's just so bizarre. It, it didn't really necessarily bother me. I think what we're all talking about, though, and, and I'll sum it up like this, because we've talked about this with other documentaries in the past. A documentary ex- uh, of this kind is generally only going to be as strong as the talking heads, yeah. right? I loved Pillman Part 1 because, you know, Kim Wood, among others, was great on that. Th- this just... None of the talking heads I thought were particularly strong mm-hmm. uh, on this documentary, and and that hurt it. Um, as far as things I liked, um, the Savage Steamboat stuff. Obviously, I that's a match that means a lot to my fandom. It was like my first favorite match. You know, I started watching WWF like two weeks before the throat injury angle, yeah. and so I couldn't wait for that match to unfold. I want to throw this to you guys. Get your pressure. So they obviously talked a lot about the planned out nature of the match and how, I mean, it's insane. The length Savage went to it, that they had the notebook and the 160 spots mm-hmm. written out and he would freaking call Steamboat in the middle of the night. He's like, Hey, what's match? What's spot 47 and mm-hmm. make him run there. I mean, that is insane. Yeah. That said, I want to defend that match. I shouldn't have to defend that match, but I'm, <laughs> I will a little bit. Well, bold angle. Yeah. In the sense that, you know, yeah, it's ridiculously planned out, but they also had less than 15 minutes on the biggest show of their lives. I don't think that match, despite what you hear about that notepad, feels as choreographed as 90% of wrestling in 2021. No, no, yeah, 100%. Because, yeah. I mean, so many of the spots that you see today require, you know, opponent cooperation. It's like, yeah, if you're armed with that insider quote unquote insider knowledge for lack of a better term um you know that they had this notepad and everything was planned out okay yeah you're saying oh i, I don't know if that's the way that wrestling should be but if you watch the match and didn't know that it would not it didn't have a fake feel to it at all no so i, I just want to say that about the match i, I think that needs to be said because too many people are oh that's not the way you do wrestling and stuff and i don't know man to me if it's gonna be the Biggest crowd you ever work in front of, and you're given less than 15 minutes. You got to get it down, man. Well, yeah. and isn't that the beauty of you know this? You know, I love this sport of professional wrestling. Is that it, you can do it in so many different ways. You know, you there isn't just one way to do it. You can you can have technical matches. You can have hardcore matches. You can have matches where they literally just go back and forth, slapping each other's chest. Um, so if, if you get the two right guys who can choreograph their match from beginning to start and they pull it off, what's wrong with that? Yeah. I thought that was one of the strongest parts of the documentary. I enjoyed that, that they had steamboat on there, given his take and everything. Uh, I didn't like how they didn't deep dive on, on the Hogan Savage mania five stuff. They showed a little bit of the footage when they were splitting on main event with Elizabeth and Elizabeth getting shoved and all that. But they could have. I would have liked to have seen him go a little bit more in that. I mean, that was the biggest match of his career, I think. So um, that that was a weakness. I would have seen. Would have liked to have seen him go deep dive on that a little bit. You know, I didn't penalize him too much for this. They clearly just decided that we're going to go hard with Savage Steamboat and make that the apex. And what they chose to do, and remember, these are kind of intended for the casual viewers. Mm-hmm. We've talked about this before. I do think for a casual viewer that they 
did successfully convey the idea that Randy Savage was as important as anyone in the WWE from that time period besides Hulk Hogan and did get kind of close to Hogan for a little bit. Mm -hmm. So you're right. You know, I think from a a, a casual fan perspective, you know, when you just go through every angle and stuff and you just, you know, dipping your toe in the waters of every angle that can get a little much. I do think you're right, Ryan, though, that I mean, WrestleMania five was a really big deal. I mean, that set a pay-per-view record that stood for nine years. And and I think they should have maybe mentioned that specifically uh, what a big deal it was. Uh, But, you know, I, I think they conveyed what a, a big star he was. You know, there wasn't the the linear storytelling of 88 through 91, but I was kind of okay with it. Um, it, it was honestly when he went to WCW that I thought the storytelling, uh, not only outside the ring, but also when it came to inside the ring, went a little off the rails. You mean you didn't buy the fact that he was only doing the juice in WCW as that lead you to believe? <laughs> <laughs> no. Now, because <laughs> we know he went off to try to have a kid with Elizabeth and he started yeah. wearing the shirt and everything. Yes. And I'm glad you brought that up. So here's what's fair and unfair. Um, it is grossly unfair to intimate that Randy Savage just started doing steroids when he went to WCW. That's ridiculous, especially when in this documentary you have Vincent Kennedy McMahon saying, you know, when he first saw Randy, oh, this guy's kind of small. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. I mean, come on, man. I mean, so, you're going to leave you're going to leave that quote in there and pretend like he wasn't, you know, doing steroids. I mean, for God's sake, I mean, basically 90 to 95 percent of the 1984 to 1989 WF locker room was doing <laughs> steroids. So um, he was included. I mean, so and I want to double back to that, actually, for a second. But fair is fair here. We should point this out with the steroid issue. And when he left, what was WWF doing in late 1994 that WCW was not lots of drug testing. Yes. Lots of drug testing. WCW never did. So that probably was another reason in addition to, Hey, we'll let you wrestle. We'll give you more money and we're not going to drug test you. So that is something that should be mentioned, but it is baloney. The idea that he never did steroids in WWE or that it was a WCW issue. I mean, I think he, he wanted to leave. The biggest reason was to wrestle. He had been pitching these. He wanted to wrestle Shawn Michaels. He wanted to wrestle Bret Hart. Him and Bret worked on a Japanese tour, but they never really got to do a program on TV. He wasn't allowed to do anything that like that. He didn't th- think he was done. And frankly, he wasn't done. He no, he wasn't. WCW. Uh, you know, the guy, when he left, he was just barely past 40 years old when he left WWF. So, I mean, all these issues is, to me, why it was a very poorly done biography it was by far the worst of the three they've aired and it's not because of the negative stuff in it i i've been very consistent in our facebook group garrett's facebook group the fight game group on twitter my biggest problem with it wasn't that he got dragged through the mud a little bit it was that it was a poorly made documentary (laughs) i mean the talking heads were bad it was cut together terribly the way that you know the fact checking uh, the way it was laid out was confusing i thought one other thing I want to mention, a big problem I have with this, and I heard Meltzer talking about this too, was the way that they made it seem that Elizabeth was his only love and that mm-hmm. you know he was just so depressed about that for the rest of his life. And that's just complete bullshit. The guy <laughs> got remarried and by all accounts was incredibly happy. He had finally found peace right before his death when he married Lynn. And that's another major. And she error. should have been on that. She should have been on the documentary. Was yes. she not on the dark side of the ring one? I don't think so. I don't recall oh. for sure. I don't think okay. so, but she might've been, I don't know, have to check, but she doesn't do, you know, many appearances at all. She stays away from it, but like, to, I mean, they showed the wedding pictures and stuff and they mentioned her, but then to, at the same time, have people implying that, Oh, Elizabeth was his one true love. That's complete bullshit. You don't know that. And, they also got the facts wrong about him and Lynn too, because, and that's another thing that's easy to fact check. They talked about someone on there said it was his high school sweetheart. And that's obviously not true. Cause they talked about how he grew up in the Chicago suburbs. And then they mentioned that they met on a beach in Florida because they met when he was playing minor league baseball, not in high school. So it was just like another factual error. They got wrong. It's just a poorly made documentary. I just, I thought it was very, very disappointing, but do I, do I, do I mention that they were confusing the ICW and the 
Jarrett <laughs> territory still? Or is yeah, <laughs> no one cares? Like they, they were making like they, they, you know, they made it seem like they were showing. They they made it seem like it was ICW, but they were actually showing footage from the Jarrett territory. By the way, dude, Randy Savage's promos in Memphis are like fucking insane. I mean, this guy was just on a different level. I mean, the internet would break today over some over somewhat of the skill set of 1984 to 1986 Randy Savage, in my <laughs> sure. opinion. I mean, my God, was this guy oh, yeah. just uh, at an unbelievable level. With the WCW run, uh, it is not as significant as his WWF run, obviously, but two things, and they did not mention this, him and Flair in early 96, right before the NWO, turned around a non-existent WCW house show business. I mean, WCW hadn't drawn at the house's for seven years. And that Flair Savage program, when they brought Liz back into the fold and she turned on Randy, which mm-hmm. was a kind of a neat little wrinkle, if you remember, they started doing business uh, around the horn uh, at the houses a little bit before the NWO even. And then, of course, the feud with Dallas Page was great, too. They had three very good matches on pay-per-view. You know, I got to say, too, in Randy's defense, I guess a little bit, you know, they brought in Liz, and I've never heard any negative stories about him and her interacting in WCW. Have you? I mean, apparently that no. was all very professional and not that long after their marriage had ended and the whole drama with the Hogans and everything. So, I mean, they didn't mention that, but they worked together amicably in WCW just a couple of years later. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, he, he again, I mean, we're, we're not to excuse. I mean, he, he was, you know, I mean, those stories about I mean, like, yeah, lock, uh, locking her in the locker room. And I mean, Meltzer retold the story about the TV dinners yeah, yeah, when he yeah. would go on the road and freaking Bobby Heenan would whistle that song. What was it? Something about yeah, like a hungry, hungry man. man. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bobby, <laughs> Bobby Heenan, God rest your soul. We miss you so much, Bobby. No, like um, I said at the top, there's no excusing any of that. We know that like off air, he wasn't the greatest person. Yeah. I would like to believe that as he got to his later years, though, he became a better person. And I mean, they didn't talk to many people that saw him. You know, we we know he did a lot of uh, charity work with children. Um, I've heard interviews with people that lived near him that he did a lot of stuff for their families and was a great guy to them in those later years. So, you know, I've in an interview, Stephanie Bellers once said that Randy didn't actually like kids, that that was all for show. And he didn't he. He didn't like kids, but I've always heard the opposite. You know, he tried to have a child with Elizabeth. He wanted kids. And I've heard multiple people say in Florida, you know, that he was great to their children that lived near him. So, I mean, who knows? But, yeah, it it was disappointing all around. I have one last thing to say, and this is actually a pretty big picture thing. So, moving forward with these A&E docs, we're obviously going to be uh, looking for how negative they go on some of these people. But... A big picture trend I've noted was the first three. And this is a little disturbing. Have you guys noticed this? All of the personal problems for these individuals seem to start when they leave the WWF umbrella. Mm-hmm. And that's just absolute hideous. <laughs> like Austin, yeah. he leaves WWF all of a sudden. He's a drunk and he's mean and he does these vague things that we're not going to mention. Roddy Piper, you know, becomes like some crazed outpatient. That mm-hmm. like says wild things at HBO. I, I we we didn't mention that at all, and I want to go in on that. I thought Vince McMahon's comments. I mean, what are you gonna expect from him? Were completely out of bounds uh, in regards to the HBO Real Sports uh, yeah. appearance. Piper, right? what did Piper say that was wrong on that? And you know, oh, they, they basically fired him. I mean, he was hundred yeah. percent right everything he said. But you know, they made him like you know he had escaped the mental home and was just yeah. saying crazy things. Um, and you know, here again, Savage like he oh, was lucky to be brought back. They kind of intimated yeah. that, like when he got back, oh, he was lucky given what he said on that show. That was kind of the gist of what yeah. how they portrayed that. Yeah, and then you know, Randy Savage, oh, you know, leaves WWE. Oh, you know, I, I think he just went there for money and to get on the gas. So <laughs> that's something to look. I mean, at moving forward, that all of a sudden, you know, these people have personal problems when they, you know, leave Stamford, Connecticut. That give me a break. You know. Along that lines as to where this seems to be going with that little clue is my my, my favorite uh, reaction to the Randy doc. And I'm not going to say who, who sent this just in case they don't want it out there. But if they want to own up to it, that's fine. My favorite reaction was I am more convinced than ever that Randy Savage slept with Stephanie McMahon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. They certainly didn't address that, did they? 
No, that's no. not going to be talked about. No. <laughs> I, I, um, I will say this. I'll say something. You know, he was inducted to the WWE Hall of Fame after he died. But I know for a fact, you know, you hear these rumors like, oh, God, you just you never bring up the name Randy Savage to Vince. That's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, I, I know people firsthand that have said that it is like, you know, a record scratching. Mm-hmm. This was years ago. If the name Randy Savage is messaged, uh, mentioned in front of Vince McMahon. It has to go beyond the Slim Jim thing. I've heard people say, oh, it's because of the Slim Jim deal. And Eric Bischoff was on here saying, you know, Randy's deal paid for itself because he brought the Slim Jim sponsorship, the 700 some thousand a year. And that was the same as his contract, which was true. But as for the first year, talked about only his first yeah. year after that, he was making like a million and a half. But there's something there's something there. I don't know what it is. I don't know the story. People are going to speculate about that forever. But there there was something there because he was the one guy he wouldn't bring back. They didn't induct him to the Hall of Fame until after he was gone. They did like bring him back for a video game commercial right before he died. And they showed that clip in the biography uh, when he was gray and everything. But uh, I mean, yeah, he, he was like the one guy that didn't get brought back. I think what's really going to tell the story here is how they treat the ultimate warrior. I mean, the next the next one's on Booker T. There's not going to be probably anything there that's going to give us any hints about the direction of this series. But when we get to that ultimate warrior one, we'll know because the way Savage was handled, if they don't talk at all about, what, 15 years of his life that he was touring college campuses and spewing that nonsense and getting banned from college campuses and writing those horrid blogs on his website. <laughs> I mean, that's what he was known for for most of the 2000s. If that doesn't yeah. get a single mention, then this thing is just it's so dishonest. If you, if you want to be objective about Randy Savage, be objective about the Ultimate Warrior. Well, I'm sure they're going to, with Booker T, they're going to bring up the arrest. Well, yeah, but I'm sure they're not going. I'm sure they're not going to show the Triple H promo. By the way, from 2003. I'm sure. I'm sure the. uh, Yeah, I'm sure the Warrior one will mention like the SummerSlam '91 holdup, but I I'm very curious how they handle his later years because if we want to talk about people that were not good outside of wrestling, and supposedly he turned it around just like Randy later in his life. But for a long time, man, you would be hard pressed to find anybody that would say anything good about this guy. So we'll see how they handle his documentary in a few weeks. Um,